What was the urgency, if any, uh, behind the summit, or was it a regular summit? What were the issues that uh, precipitated this summit at this time? It's supposed to be a regular summit because this is actually the sixth one, but uh, it was delayed because of COVID. But at the same time, I think the uh, the, the European uh, partners also picked up the signal that Africa just wanted EU to do much, much more than it's been doing. And uh, they felt there was a need at least to ensure that um, the uh, this summit was held. And uh, more importantly, uh, France also has been playing a very important role and it felt under the French presidency that they should um, do something to ensure that uh, uh, we we move uh, relations forward. All right, uh, let's uh, return to the studio. we we'll back uh, with the ambassador in, in due course. Uh, for now, let's uh, uh, bring in uh, the Minister of Health, Dr. Osage Ehanuri. Uh, so, uh, there is a health component in some of the agreements you know, reached uh, at, at, at this summit. And uh, of course, uh, uh, every Nigerian uh, will be interested uh, to know uh, how such agreements will impact on Nigeria, uh, assuming uh, the agreements are uh, uh, fully implemented. And let us know some of those areas that, of course, uh, the, the health sector is going to benefit from the EU package. Well, there were two main areas. One is the health system strengthening, and the other was the vaccine production initiative. The experience from the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and uh, what was perceived as vaccine nationalism uh, led to quite a lot of uh, uh, concern on the African continent and also uh, in South America about how to access vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics for that matter when you have a serious emergency. And those who have the capacity to produce first of all, keep the products to themselves. So that was sensed in Europe, and it was also, uh, for that reason, uh, on the uh, agenda, uh, the capacity of vaccine production in Africa. Of course, the World Health Organization and the African Union uh, made a very good point of that, and have been pressing for uh, technical capacity to be able to produce uh, vaccines, not only COVID-19 vaccines, but any vaccines that will be useful as time goes on. Now, you, uh, sorry, Kisley, yeah, you, ahead, you, you just mentioned the vaccine nationalism, you know, which played out uh, within this period of, uh, you know, COVID-19. And uh, what you have just said um, will make one to believe that uh, perhaps uh, in, in due course, uh, with the assistance of the EU, that a country like Nigeria uh, will begin to produce uh, vaccines locally. How are we sure that uh, the assistance expected from the EU nations uh, will, um, you know, uh, ensure that Nigeria gets into uh, the uh, uh, Committee of Nations, you know, who manufacture vaccines? And there also, also there have been some uh, efforts being made in the past locally here to begin this uh, vaccine production. What is the synergy between the local plans and, of course, the plans that are now coming from the EU? Well, the EU plan and also what the World Health Organization was pressing and uh, the African Union was for the vaccines against these emerging diseases. Of course, there are vaccines that were being produced before against routine, uh, the so-called uh, expanded program on immunization vaccines, which uh, normally are used in uh, various countries. So this particular new vaccine uh, uh, was uh, the uh, mRNA-based vaccine, which holds a lot of promise for other vaccines uh, in the future. So it is the technology to produce it domestically and also to be able to join the nation of uh, countries that have capacity to respond to an attack on humanity because uh, COVID-19 was actually not just uh, a threat to individual nations, uh, to, to, the, to the entire uh, community of, uh, of man. And therefore, the capacity to uh, respond should also be evenly spread around the world. And that is the reason for the collaboration that uh, the EU had with the WHO to now select some countries in Africa to uh, have uh, capacity to produce uh, vaccines of that type. Sorry, Honorable Minister, I'll clarify this because the uh, Director General of the WHO uh, 
announced the five African countries that have been selected uh, for vaccine uh, production, Nigeria, of course, being one of those countries. Uh, and now the EU itself is saying it will provide some 450 million, uh, hundreds of millions of doses of, of vaccine by the middle of this year. It, it, is the capacity for uh, vaccine production being funded by uh, the EU or the, uh, what, what is their role in, in the, in the uh, announcement made by the WHO that some five countries or so have been uh, identified as uh, you know, vaccine producing countries on the continent. And now they say they want to ship in hundreds of millions of vaccine doses in another four months. How, how do we reconcile well, that? Yes, uh, well, it's easy to reconcile because the vaccines we are talking about now are the ones that we need now. Uh, so they are going to support the supply of vaccines so that we don't run out of vaccines. Now the capacity to manufacture vaccines uh, will not materialize over the next year or two at, at the earliest. So in between that period, you need to have vaccines to use. And uh, the, uh, also, in fact, the manufacturing capacity will not necessarily be uh, targeted to COVID-19 because by the time uh, uh, you have the capacity to manufacture, there will be enough vaccines on the market and the COVID will probably not be a front burner anymore. But again, you have the capacity to respond to any other type of vaccine requirement in the future without having to uh, go begging in Europe or uh, uh, using your resources uh, dedicated to other things to procure inexpensive vaccines. Okay. Uh, uh, all right, uh, Honorable Minister, thanks. We will we'll return mm -hmm. to uh, some of the further details of the health component of, of the summit. Uh, Malala Gabashu, you were with uh, the president at, uh, at, at the summit. That's, uh, you've been with him on uh, some other occasions uh, where he has attended some other summits. Could you make a comparison, if you will, uh, in terms of, uh, of the issues that were canvassed uh, and then the outcomes of, of this latest summit? Well, certainly there was a marked difference. Uh, and uh, you can almost feel and touch you know, those things that have been achieved. Uh, vaccine is just being discussed now, production on the continent. Uh, you know, before this time, the World Health Organization had uh, made the choice of uh, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, South Africa, and Senegal as only four countries to produce. And, uh, you know, we must give credit to the Minister of Health sitting here. I mean, maybe he's not the one to say this himself, but. Uh, there was a lot of hard work behind the scenes. And uh, including, of course, the, the, the role of uh, Okonje Wala, also of WTO, a Nigerian, which is a good thing to have your people up in places like that. Amina Mohammed and you know, all of the roles they played. But the president you know, made the deliberate choice to choose on committees to work on. You know, the summit this time around was not set up uh, like in a preliminary you know, kind of uh, you know, format. They set up round tables around key issues, about five, uh, seven of those round table issues. And the uh, African leaders were to co-chair with one African or two African leaders and two, one or two European leaders would co-chair the round tables. And of course, the president made the deliberate choice of choosing the round table. You have to belong to two and no other. He chose um, peace, security, and, and, and good governance, which of course are you know, existential threats to our own country. But he also chose the issue of health and vaccine production in the belief that all of the efforts they have been making will build up to a point where a decision will be made to choose Nigeria. Because if you left Nigeria out, you are doing a lot of injustice. One out of every five Africans is a Nigerian. Then, you know, the people are here, the education, the educated people and all of the skills are. So why leave, you, leave us out? So it's a middle achievement that we got this one. But beyond this also, there were also issues of trade. And I, I don't, I'm sure a lot of our viewers also will have read the, the opinion as published by, by Politico which is a dominant uh, publication in, in, in Brussels there. 
uh, and President Buhari did articulate these issues. The Europeans have been having an easy ride on the continent. This is supposed to be a partnership of equals of the two continents, Europe and Africa. But as you all know, Europeans, they have access to our own markets, agriculture, everything. We don't have equal access for it. This is just one example. Either because they impose quality standards that are higher than we can achieve, and also the fact that they provide subsidy, for instance, to the agriculture, about 50 billion. So the thing then is that we just export raw materials to them, and they have not been doing manufacturing, which, which is job heavy. These are what the things that we need in the country, and the president really did make the point. We need, they need to bring industries here so that the skills that are flying out of our continent, they will be retained here, and there will be peace. They will t t also not have the kind of problems that they have. But I think that the biggest turning point is also the realization on their part that they are losing the continent to China and to Russia. You know, the, 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 the political strategic clout of these two countries is rising in the continent. Look at the infrastructure projects going on on the continent, major infrastructure. In 2013, the Western countries had 37% of all ongoing major projects on the country, on the continent. China had about 12%. This year, I mean 2000, that's about two years ago, before COVID, China was doing 31% of this kind of projects. And the entire West, including America, had only 12%. So they are concerned, they're losing the continent, and they want to come back. I think that's, uh, let me just stop here, maybe that will be. No, you will not stop there, really. You know, you, yes, you know, because mm. uh, from journalistic point of view, mm. you know, as Kinsley pointed out earlier on, that you have attended some of uh, the previous summits, yes. you know, and similar uh, mm. uh, 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 summits, right, uh, with, with the president. And uh, uh, we are very sure that uh, in those summits, mm. some of these issues that you raised now, you know, came up. Mm. Agreements were reached and, and what have you. And uh, from the view of a journalist, uh, do you think that uh, the, the EU uh, has uh, played the role expected of them from the agreements signed in the previous summits? And now, what makes you feel that this sixth summit, which of course you said it came with a difference, uh, will impact o o on Africa. You, you talked about uh, uh, a partnership of equals. How would we now be equals with people that you ask to borrow you money to develop your infrastructure? What is the strategy you know, available to African nations you know, to see how they can change the minds of uh, the, the EU uh, to really uh, put their foot o o on Africa as expected? Uh, after all, most of these European nations colonized African nations, mm -hmm. all like the Asians mm -hmm. and the other uh, uh, regions that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, did uh, all of the past summits achieve or take us to where we wished to be? No, absolutely no. And this is why we are here now. And this is why all of these things are being talked about. The African countries, you know, in their own thinking, the way they approached the whole thing, is to say to the Europeans that we have done enough of talking. Enough agreements have been signed. What then follows next? What are the actions to be taken? And as uh, you know, the ambassador has uh, mentioned, and uh, your earlier reports also did indicate, you can see that there is a sizable amount of money, 150 billion euros. Of course, the idea is maybe to counterbalance what China is doing with the road, uh, BRI Belt and Road Initiative. And they call their own Global Gateway Project. And, and they want to put money to boost internet access on the continent, to boost renewable energy, to boost transportation and, and, and agriculture. So we're getting somewhere. But then the question is that it has to wait until we see how far they go. And believing that there is good faith in their, on their part, as there is on our own part, and to see how far they will take this. 
you know, I, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, Malan Gabashil, I mean, from uh, the outside of, of the confines of the, of the summit venues, uh, the issues that you have indicated, they are heartwarming uh, to uh, Africans and particularly uh, for us uh, Nigerians. But when you look at one or two of the outcomes, mm -hmm. such as the monies that uh, you have pointed out, and Ambassador Odomo also earlier mentioned, some persons are bound to wonder whether this is not a reinforcement of a donor recipient uh, relationship that we have had, rather mm -hmm. than a true partnership. Mm -hmm. Because earlier you were talking about trade and the desire of uh, African nations, say Nigeria in particular, mm -hmm. for value addition. We have to have our factories and industries working. Mm -hmm. Those monies you mentioned now do not appear to be targeting uh, investments to say, look, you know, let's let's have our factories. Let's have, you know, we are exporting. I mean, basic things that we know, for instance, cassava, uh, <laughs> yam, and mm. and these are uh, these are agricultural produce from mm. which you could make a broad range of uh, industrial extracts mm. uh, and so on and so forth. So, w what are we looking at? Is this a reinforcement of of the donor recipient thing, so as to ward off China and Russia? Well, a lot, a lot of things have also changed, and they're changing on the continent. And uh, that, that is really making, perhaps, our partners overseas to kind of sit up. Because uh, you know that uh, the CFE, the Continental Free, Free, Free Trade Agreement, Continental Free Trade Agreement on the continent is already signed is into effect. This is the biggest free trade area anywhere in the world. Africa also has the fastest growing uh, population and the economies are up and coming. So the thing is that there is something to look to. And the, it, quite unlike uh, the past relationships, when they, they, th they dropped these things on your lap, no, we now have something to offer. Africa is attractive and, uh, and uh, the, the fact that this partners, the friends in Europe we had, had laid back. And they are now seeing that others are coming to seize upon the situation. It's making it competitive and they are rushing to. So really the relationship, and in any case, even this 150 billion euros we mentioned, the full details have not been announced. So I cannot say that they are targeted at the issues we have raised. However, the African leaders must agree to the terms. This is what was agreed to. So going forward, it's, it's not as if they will load it upon us. No, there will be agreements and we will have, they have to be acceptable you know, to our own leaders and to our continent. All right. Uh, uh, thank you, Malam Garbashehu, for uh, that uh, for the, you know, clarification. Uh, let's return to His Excellency Ambassador uh, Obina Ono. You've listened to um, the, the last speaker who actually touched on very pertinent issue to respect to uh, EU relationship with the, with the EU. In one of the questions Kinsley asked, he, he mentioned the fact that uh, we have remained the exporter of uh, raw materials uh, without uh, value addition. And for you to have value addition on those raw materials, there has to be industry, there have to be industries in, in the country. We have to uh, up uh, our ante when it comes to manufacturing. And some of the machinery required for, this, for that sector uh, cannot be produced uh, in Africa. Now, part of the uh, money being expected you know, from EU to African nations about is, uh, should actually be uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in invested into real manufacturing sector for African nations. Now, is there any mechanism put in place to follow up on what has been agreed upon to ensure adequate implementation. That's number one. Number two is, yes, we're talking about EU. EU is made of many nations. Is Nigeria also engaging individual countries in, in the EU for uh, their own unilateral agreements and, and, and what have you? Uh, thank you very much for the summit. As I mentioned earlier, there's a, uh, a mechanism uh, set up to ensure that uh, decisions are implemented, and this is the first time. And uh, it's going to bring together uh, partners on, uh, on both sides to uh, check on the progress that we are, are making. 
And uh, for us also missions, yeah, it's also our responsibility to ensure that uh, we engage the EU as we have been doing. For instance, on the issue of uh, uh, manufacturing hub, uh, we've already started discussions with the EU. We expect at least some financial and technical support to Nigeria in the process. And uh, so actually we, as a mission, it's our responsibility as well as other African missions here to ensure that we follow up with the EU on the implementation of these uh, uh, decisions or agreements reached. And uh, on the issue of manufacturing, we, we have uh, the EU business forum, which uh, brings together some businesses and the uh, good interface with the uh, uh, businesses in various uh, African countries. They have an office in uh, Lagos. We are trying to uh, resuscitate the group to ensure that they also uh, add value to what we are doing back home. I think the EU is uh, uh, actually poised to uh, to improve relations uh, with the various countries, particularly Nigeria. There are so many activities we envisage uh, later in the course of the year, uh, visits, uh, ministerial dialogue, and uh, dialogue at expert level. And uh, we actually have a roadmap with the EU that was created just about two years ago, and it's working very well. For the first time, we have having structured relations with the EU. We have some uh, timelines and we have some activities that we have to do in the next uh, uh, few months or maybe two years. So I think uh, basically we see some uh, interest, renewed interest on, uh, by the EU, not just uh, in Africa, but also in Nigeria. So we, uh, we think there's uh, hope and uh, we are working hard to ensure that uh, we are able to achieve much uh, in the next uh, couple of uh, months and years. Ambassador Onowo, tell us something. I mean, the EU is uh, a very well established block, uh, economic and political block. The same with uh, uh, the AU, but we know that the differences are also fairly obvious. And oftentimes there is a tendency uh, in some quarters outside of the continent to mistake uh, Africa uh, for a country. So when we hear that uh, the EU uh, is shelling out, that, let's say, 150 million uh, euros or plants uh, to uh, invest uh, any such amount you know, in, EU, in, in the AU countries, uh, do we have a sense of uh, the target countries uh, for such investments? Or do, do we, how? What's, that's, uh, are individual countries now to make themselves attractive? And if so, what, is, what could Nigeria possibly do in this regard? They already have a format. For instance, uh, we've, uh, we engage them, and then we, uh, we always try to emphasize the point that, one, uh, our population is, uh, is an issue to consider. We are also the largest economy in Africa. We expect that uh, when EU is considering, for instance, what to do with the 150 uh, billion, they are conscious of the fact that Nigeria is unique. And uh, apart from the frameworks that we use to negotiate with the EU, like the Organization of African Caribbean Pacific States, we also have direct access to the EU. The EU also it's, uh, recognizes the role of Nigeria, and they have they created a nice a special relationship with Nigeria. Uh, just uh, before this summit, the vice, one of the vice presidents visited Nigeria and made a lot of promises uh, to assist uh, the startups in Nigeria. And uh, she just came back recently. And we're expecting also some other uh, visits by the vice president. So they look at peculiarities, the, each, uh, some of the, the countries within the continent. So it's not like you have 150 billion and then you have to share. 5 billion each country, no. They just have to look at the needs in various countries. And um, Nigeria ranks very high. And uh, so we, 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 what we is going to happen now is that um, they will start engaging various countries, just Nigeria. 
and uh, from there they will be able to apportion the, the resources appropriately. All right, uh, thank you, Ambassador uh, Ono. Uh, back here in Abuja, uh, we still have our guests, uh, Dr. Sege Hanire, Honorable Minister of Health, and of course, uh, uh, the senior specialist uh, uh, advisor to the president on media, uh, Malam Garbasheru. Uh, Honorable Minister, you talked about uh, health system strengthening in your opening uh, remarks. And uh, that, of course, what I understood by that is the fact that uh, if uh, Nigeria uh, benefits from the 150 billion uh, fund being expected from the EU, that uh, a portion of it uh, will be. Uh, invested in, in the health sector. What are those uh, uh, very uh, critical areas uh, you know, that you think uh, Nigeria will, of course, uh, uh, divert attention to respect to enhancing uh, the health sector? Well, there are, I'll just mention the most important ones. Uh, one is universal health coverage, that you need to be able to get health services to as many people in your country as possible, to the majority, 80, 90 percent should have access to healthcare, basic healthcare. So the universal health coverage is a very strong aspect. Then there is also the aspect of preparedness. Uh, we uh, made this experience with the outbreak of uh, COVID-19, which was later declared a pandemic. And you see that various uh, countries had different uh, ways in which they responded. Some responded very well, some didn't respond very well because the health system was not prepared. They didn't uh, move as quickly or as efficiently. So strengthening uh, the uh, public health sector and also the, uh, in, in our case, the port health services and uh, the capacity to look after patients who fall ill are two very important parts. And then there's, of course, the health financing how do we finance healthcare? How do we provide enough money to take care of the needs of the country? And how well are these needs taken care of? So those are just the main, three main important things that uh, we like to talk about in health system strengthening. Well, in the universal health coverage, what are we looking at? Is it the primary health care system or, or what else? What are, what are we looking at and what kind of support are we seeking? Yes, it begins with the primary health care system to be able to get health care to the majority of the people. The primary health care system, when well established, has the capacity to take care of at least 60% of the health needs of the population, to reduce all those indices that we find embarrassing, the very high maternal mortality, the very high uh, under five mortality, the high rate of TB, HIV, and, and uh, uh, other uh, diseases that are ravaging the country. You, and even neglected tropical diseases that have been in the background for a long time. So the capacity to be able to handle these diseases, including capacity to educate the people on disease prevention, health promotion, immunization, reproductive health, nutrition, all these capacities can be exercised at the primary level. So the importance of primary health care, primary health care centers, at the moment is more than the tertiary big hospitals. We have enough of those. I mean, not enough, but we have many. But what we are very short of now are functional primary health care centers to reach the majority of Nigerians with very basic things that they require, skilled birth attendance and uh, immunization, treatment of the three basic things that kill children, pneumonia, malaria, and diarrhea. You must be able to attend to these very basic things, and that is what the universal health coverage is about. You know, Honorable Minister, I'm, I'm sorry to jump in here, because this is a matter that we've been pursuing uh, in recent years uh, with some vigor. Uh, while you were Minister of State, your, um, uh, your counterpart who was Minister of Health talked about resuscitating the primary health care centers and in there to reestablish uh, tens of thousands of them in different parts of the country. And I don't know whether my colleague and I, Kirian, uh, were on set together, but I recall we had a program on Good Morning Nigeria. And, and it turned out that in some states, all they were more interested in was just uh, having a building, a structure, you know, painted, and they say you have a primary health care center. So what, what are the core issues that we have identified uh, in really ramping up our primary health care services? Uh, not just a center, services now, that will say, okay, this is, what, this is our, our shopping list so that when 
funding comes or when support comes from the EU, we will know how to target it and then uh, deal with some of these basic ailments that tend to crowd uh, teaching uh, hospitals. Yes, you are correct. And that is the reason why that the agenda is a major agenda of, in the health sector of this administration is the universal health coverage at primary health care, beginning at primary health care level. Now, we have to get everybody on board in that respect. When I say everybody, I'm talking about the layers of government, federal, state, local government, and our development part partners. We're not always uh, all together on board. You see that some state uh, are building large hospitals instead of fo uh, focusing first on the primary health care centers. And then, of course, the universal, uh, the basic health care provision fund, which the federal government provides, needs to be augmented with the same amount of investment from states, local governments, and our partners. So that is the message you are trying to send across for us to focus on this area a concerted effort that brings everybody on the same page to build the infrastructure, train the human resources, have the supply chain management, and then the financing, health financing structure that goes, uh, that, t that runs and operates this uh, system. Okay. Uh, all right. Madam uh, Gabashehu, uh, there are two uh, you know, key areas uh, I'd like you to, to uh, talk about. Um, uh, considering that you are part of uh, this uh, summit, and that's on uh, the issue of uh, illicit financial flow and, of course, uh, security. Um, was there um, any uh, discussions at the, at the roundtable level uh, on some of the, these uh, two issues, which, of course, is plaguing uh, Nigeria and uh, many other African nations? Uh, another is the issue of uh, uh, key details, you know, that of course uh, re-emerged on the African continent, especially the West African sub-region. Uh, where those uh, <coughs> issues uh, mentioned, the EFS, uh, how could the uh, EU uh, provide some level of assistance to African nations with respect to all that? Well, uh, I'll talk about two things. Uh, one, you know that uh, the, uh, the f first formal meeting of the African Union G4 uh, held in, in Europe, uh, Brussels. Uh, Algeria, Nigeria, uh, Senegal, and South, Senegal, South Africa, and uh, I believe Kenya also. The That's already more than four. No, well, uh, actually, uh, I guess that was the option of Senegal. Oh. Uh, Senegal was co-opted. Now, the, the thing about uh, this is, is, is that uh, there is a sense that in the same way and manner that the G7 or G8, depending on which one you believe, is, is governing the affairs in a way of the world, the economy, security, and political systems, Africa has gotten to the point where we also have a G4 and that will decide on matters of security, of conflicts, and how, if you know, agreements are there, how they are implemented in the, in the, in the, in the, in the under the purview of the African Union. So uh, security was key, will continue to be key, and will continue to look at these things. The issue of coup d'etat, uh, really, yes, the president made a big issue of it because, uh, of course, it has happened mostly in West Africa. I guess we have had the fifth or so. Uh, so far. And uh, so what the president was telling the world is, look, there must be consequences for disruption of democracy, you know, the way they are throwing out democratically elected governments uh, in, in, in Africa. That under the AU, our countries are able to do some things. We're able to do sanctions to isolate countries and punish them. It would appear that this is, is not sufficient. And all of the countries, and you can see that like Mali, for instance. When France says, as he said, we want to go out, they said, go quickly. Because they are, by, at the time France was uh, threatening them, they were shopping for partners in other parts of the world. So the entire world has got to come to terms with the fact that we, we can't continue uh, in this way. So uh, I guess basically this is uh, answering your question. 
we are uh, really going to see some difference because if uh, sanctions against countries, rogue administrations such as Mali, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Burkina Faso. No, Burkina Faso. No, no, Guinea Bissau is not there. There was what? an attempt in Guinea Bissau. Oh, Guinea Bissau was there. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, Guinea Conakry. It was, it was for Guinea, 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 Guinea Conakry. Conakry. And to some extent, even Chad, which is uh, mm -hmm. also seen as a, as a cool situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, if the world speaks with one voice and uh, they are isolated, they crumble. Now we see Mali is even going to court now, ECOWAS court, to say that their suspension from the monetary exchange mechanisms should be reinstated. They're feeling the pinch. Oh, all right, and, now, what and, about and, the, and, sorry, no, killer, this killer. illicit... Hey, no, Mali, hey, Mali, I know you want to come yeah, to yeah. the issue of illicit financial flows, but there, there was this critical aspect that, uh, that Mala Gaba was talking about, which was uh, the president's uh, uh, voice uh, against unconstitutional change of government. I'm just wondering, what was the reaction uh, from uh, the EU partners? to this, uh, because we have seen a contagion, on, particularly in West Africa. Mm -hmm. and ECOWAS, as a sub-regional entity, has uh, taken all the steps that its uh, uh, protocols would mm -hmm. allow. Mm -hmm. The AU has also taken steps that its protocols would allow. Uh, if there is no support from outside of, uh, of, of the sub-region of the continent, uh, what, what more uh, could be done? Mali yesterday uh, voted uh, to say that uh, they were going to have military rule for five years. For five years. Five years. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's like saying, look, uh, you know, this doesn't really matter. So what was, the, what, what was the body language of those who listened to the president to say, uh, look, we're having a rollback of democracy on the continent, more particularly in West Africa? Well, uh, maybe at some point the Minister of Health would, was in the room, he probably would tell you more of her body language. <laughs> what, what, what I can say to you is that I think that we have seen effect because on the same day that the EU Africa session, um, you know, uh, the, the French, uh, French president had a side meeting with some of these African partners and that was the decision, that was when he announced the decision to pull out of Mali and the, their European partners. But at the end of the day, what did we have? At least we have a situation that is slightly moderated. Mali is today, they say, three quarters of that country is ungoverned, uh, Islamic State and all of that. So uh, if uh, the care is not taken, there will be, Islamic State will have their first flag and nation on, on the continent in West Africa. So but at, at least we now have a situation where Mali, uh, the French troops and their European partners will camp in Niger Republic so block uh, the f outflow and they also in some other neighboring countries that are French speaking so that at least there is the containment of Mali and that it doesn't flow out to destabilize the rest of the sub-region. Well, I, I guess why Mali voted for military rule for five years is because of uh, the, the war situation in, in, in the country. Just uh, like we had uh, from Burkina Faso, uh, although that uh, no enough excuse to remove a democratically elected government, uh, that uh, uh, some elements uh, who are perhaps terrorists have been attacking the nation and sacking some communities in some rural areas, uh, but the president could not provide, uh, you know, uh, w uh, the equipment they require, you know, to of course uh, 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 fight uh, those uh, terrorists. Well, that's not enough excuse anyway. It's not possible. right, but again, uh, as you rightly said, so in uh, five years the military junta will deal with it. <laughs> oh, well, of course, that, that's what I, that, that's what I, what I believe in. <laughs> I'd like to bring in uh, Ambassador Obinono once more here, and that's on the issue of uh, illicit financial flow. Uh, there is still this uh, insinuation that um, uh, many Nigerian funds, uh, Nigeria's funds, are still stashed away in so many countries across uh, Europe uh, and America. Or, or, or did African uh, leaders you know, raise a, a, a such issue uh, in their conversation during the, 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 the summit? And uh, e e if yes, what are the areas uh, that uh, the EU nations plan to assist uh, uh, to cope that menace. Now, before you answer this question, uh, let's take a short break. When we return, we'll get back to you. All right, you welcome back, and thank you for staying with us up till uh, this moment. Uh, let's uh, return to Ambassador Obidna Onu. Uh, before the break, I was talking about uh, uh, illicit uh, financial 
you know, inflow to European countries. Um, was this part of a conversation at any point during the summit? Uh, if yes, what are the areas, you know, uh, through which uh, the EU nations can assist Nigeria and indeed other African nations to stop uh, illicit uh, financial flows? Uh, Kieran, the EU, they have a very strong uh, anti-money laundering and terrorist financing regime. Uh, a few years back, Nigeria was uh, blacklisted along uh, Libya as uh, countries with uh, deficient uh, uh, regulations or, or, or standards. And uh, recently, we had cause to engage uh, EU uh, on this matter. Uh, they have actually been supportive. Uh, the problem, rather, we even say for African delegations here, we, that we feel that they are too quite stringent or too stringent on what they are doing. Uh, countries are picked up and then are listed uh, and then the sanctions are applied. And we felt that it should be the responsibility of an international body, not just the um, EU as um, a regional body. So for EU, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very tough um, issue here, moving funds within the EU. Even delegations, missions here have been complaining about the rules that they have here. They are quite uh, stringent. So I think the, the EU will be supportive. Uh, they have also been assisting us in terms of uh, the technical capacity uh, with NFIU. They've been uh, collaboration with the NFIU. So we, what they expect actually is for us to uh, to come forward with proposals and uh, they are willing to support us. There's actually collaboration between the EU and NFIU on this uh, uh, issue. Well, no, I still want to stay with you and uh, dredge up the uh, issue that uh, Malan Garba had uh, also earlier addressed, uh, namely uh, the president's call uh, for more severe sanctions uh, on uh, regimes that emerge on the African continent via unconstitutional means. It, it tell us what the body language is like, say, within the EU in terms of aiding regional bodies such as ECOWAS and the uh, the continental body AU in imposing additional sanctions uh, that could cripple uh, and therefore uh, discourage uh, undemocratic uh, takeover of governments on the continent. I wanted to come back to that issue because the, they've actually been supportive. Uh, there have been uh, sanctions placed on individuals in Mali and uh, also they're working on uh, same situation in Guinea. The problem here is that because there are 28 countries and they do a lot of negotiations, it takes quite uh, a long time to to come up with uh, uh, decisions. But uh, uh, some uh, Malians are actually on this uh, sanctions list, and then they are also considering the situation in the other countries. So they've actually been uh, supportive to uh, decisions of uh, ECOWAS. Uh, most times when the decisions are taken, they are also debated here and uh, the, as a body, they rally around to also place uh, uh, sanctions. So I must say that uh, the, the body language is a very, very positive one and um, it's for ECOWAS also to continue to engage uh, the EU on the matter. Uh, well, uh, 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 Ambassador, we're not putting you on this spot, uh, but because you are on ground, uh, I have, uh, I'm Ambassador to Belgium, Luxembourg, and of course EU. Uh, it's a huge uh, a portfolio, so uh, don't mind us when we ask you uh, uh, too many questions. Uh, and the next will be on the issue of uh, technology transfer. How willing do you think that the EU uh, will be willing uh, to assist Nigeria in technology transfer, especially in the manufacture of uh, ag agricultural equipment and, of course, uh, machinery for industrialization? I think it's not as uh, EU as a body, but there are some uh, uh, businesses that are quite uh, in interested in uh, 
sharing technology with Nigeria. And, and um, for instance, in Belgium, we the last year we were supposed to have a trade mission from Belgium to Nigeria, but which couldn't hold, but we expect that uh, sometime this year. And uh, so far we have uh, not uh, less than 40 companies that are willing, that are anxious to come to Nigeria, some to trade and others to invest. You see uh, some willingness on the part of uh, uh, European com uh, com companies to explore the African market, um, uh, uh, preferably the Nigerian market, because they know it's, it's a huge market. There's interest in Nigeria, and uh, situations are getting a little bit tight here, so others are looking for what we can call it, the greener pastures, and the greener pastures in Africa uh, particularly East Nigeria. So there's interest in Nigeria and uh, we keep getting um, calls and um, uh, some uh, visits uh, here at the embassy, people who want to explore Nigeria, the country. They have issues maybe once in a while about uh, maybe repatriation of foreign exchange, but uh, by and large, I think there's a great interest in, in Nigeria. All right. Uh, thank you, Ambassador No, I just uh, come back to Malam Garbashehu. Malam Garbashehu, uh, the president chose, as you said, uh, the roundtable on uh, on peace and security, and, and the other also on health. Did the issue of the sources of small arms and light weapons come up? Uh, I'm asking this question because part of the security challenge that we face in West Africa and therefore in Africa is the plenitude of small arms and light weapons. And some of these small arms and light weapons have their origin in Europe, where they are manufactured. As a matter of fact, to say more, uh smashing up the Gaddafi regime, they pumped in more weapons than any country would ever need to solve their domestic problems. Because uh, reports then clearly indicated that uh, pistols and, and uh, submachine guns were being airdropped in many c c parts of Libya. So uh, just take one and go fight Gaddafi. And so they have achieved that. And this is what the president keeps talking about. Now, some of those fighters in Libya's, Gaddafi's Libya were West Africans themselves, trained as mercenaries, and they had finished their job there. So they have come home with their weapons, and they're punishing us. You know, and there's a trafficking also of those weapons from Libya across the borders. In one or two, I will not mention, but as you sell uh, yams and, and okro in, in the market, Guns are on display in, in some of our neighboring countries. So you pick and choose which one you want to buy. So it's a big issue. And the, 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 the president's effort is to make Europeans realize that they have a responsibility in this because they are a key factor in bringing us to where we are today. Have they listened? I hope they did. But I can't answer your question. <laughs> well, <laughs> to, 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 uh, to, to be clear, really, uh, when uh, our president came to power in 2015, you know, and uh, this issue of uh, light weapons were discussed, he, he made mention of the fact that looked like it was uh, the, the, their source is Libya. That's he was so emphatic mm -hmm. on that, you know, mm -hmm. as a military uh, person, that look, something that happened in Libya has uh, already, uh, you know, uh, be, be been exacerbated, and then persons, like you said, mercenaries who worked for Gaddafi are now working for themselves, you know, across other nations. Uh, in Africa. Um, uh, let me ask uh, uh, Dr. Sagi this question. It may not necessarily be uh, on health matters. And uh, that is to say, the monitoring of uh, the implementation of agreements reached at this uh, uh, AU EU uh, uh, summit, should that be a, a, a body constituted to monitor? Uh, from sector to sector, uh, some of the agreements uh, Nigeria signed with the EU, and to see how the implementation uh, could be achieved, you know, hitch free. Ambassador Onowo said something about it uh, during his response. 
about monitoring uh, agreements and that some agreements in the past were achieved, others were partially achieved and some were not achieved. So I think this time, yes, definitely there should be a mechanism of that nature uh, to follow up uh, on this uh, meeting, very important because it was uh, uh, delayed by about a year, this uh, summit, and uh, the decisions here were supposed to be far-reaching. Uh, again, coming back to the one about vaccines, uh, you know that we also had a lot of issues regarding the intellectual property rights, about whether they'll be conceding uh, those international property rights. And uh, Dr. Konjo Ewela, who was uh, the DG of the uh, World Trade Organization, was very passionate about making that point that Europe should uh, uh, release intellectual property rights to manufacture. So those issues will need to be followed up uh, where, where no decision was taken, where further consultation is necessary. And those uh, few areas where we had actually full agreement should actually be monitored. Uh, in the health sector area, we are gearing up to look at uh, uh, the advantages and, and the next steps that we're going to take from uh, the uh, concession we have to now join the nation of uh, those who are going to be producing the mRNA vaccine. That's the one we're targeting because it provides a platform for uh, uh, making many other types of vaccines. So the, uh, yes, it's a very good idea. We need to be able to follow up on the monitoring. So, as you said, you said uh, intellectual property right. Uh, let's get it uh, clarified. Um, now Nigeria is uh, one of the countries chosen, you know, for this uh, experimentation of you know, manufacturing of vaccines in Africa. Uh, are, you, are, are you saying that uh, they need to release this intellectual property right to a local company in Nigeria, for instance, for the manufacture of vaccines? Or are we going to have a situation where we have Pfizer America, Pfizer Nigeria, mm -hmm. uh, as the case may be? Let's get a clarification on this. Well, first of all, this is a WHO initiative, that not the European Union, the uh, uh, manufacturing uh, capacity, it's WHO. And uh, they intend to support African countries based on what the achievement uh, in South Africa, because South Africa has actually already produced an mRNA vaccine uh, cap uh, capable, I mean, waiting for uh, trials. And it is based on that that all the other five are going to be uh, hubs for that mRNA. But some like Senegal have gone ahead already to have some negotiation with BioNTech, for example, uh, in, uh, uh, in Germany, to also have that uh, intellectual, that concession given to them directly from BioNTech. Uh, in this regard, we are also looking to talk to producers to see what concession they can give us. Uh, it hasn't uh, been very easy because Nigeria was not among those prioritized for these vaccines at the beginning. They prioritized other countries because of very strong backing from some European former colonial power. Uh, so we had to do, we had to have an uphill a struggle to actually get on this list. Uh, we had been earmarked as a country that consumes and not produces, and, and we're preparing just to uh, produce somewhere else and then uh, be shipping to us. So <coughs> being in the midst of it now, we have to actually uh, walk the walk of, uh, uh, of uh, manufacturing here by whatever means uh, and partnership we can work on. If you're manufacturing here, you have your under license uh, by the parent company that has the intellectual property. Mm -hmm. In this case, for instance, when the EU says that they're going to ship hundreds of millions of vaccine doses by the middle of this year, it means that those uh, vaccines will be produced uh, in their uh, plants, in their plants, and then shipped uh, here. Mm -hmm. But if you are a licensed manufacturer, it means you are giving, uh, you are giving the code, if, as it were, uh, to put it together in your environment. Uh, but it's a fairly complicated intellectual it property is, process. Uh, Ambassador Onowu, Ambassador Onowu, uh, still with us uh, via Zoom from Brussels. Uh, climate change was also on the cards. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, it said, yes, green energy and all that, they would assist us, but it sometimes, when I, when I hear issues around uh, climate change being discussed and what kind of capacity uh, we would have uh, from either donors or do-gooders, I, I, I just keep asking myself whether the focus is right. 
uh, a number of times you, they're talking about off-grid locations and so on and so forth. Off-grid locations, why those ones could be helpful uh, in terms of uh, boosting uh, welfare and health issues. Where our power challenges lie mostly are in the urban and semi-urban areas where you have production and more productive activities. What is it that the EU is looking on doing here where on the African continent abundance of sun, abundance of wind, you couldn't possibly be in search of uh, primary sources uh, for green energy? Um, actually, EU wants to support, but uh, it depends also on the proposals that we, as a country, are able to bring to the EU, either to fund or to, or to assist. Uh, basically, yes, we have abundance of sun, but uh, it's for us also to, to come up with uh, proposals and then uh, to discuss also with the EU. Uh, just like the, uh, we've been discussing in the past uh, uh, couple of uh, uh, minutes, we do not expect it should be a, a kind of donor-recipient um, relationship. They expect us to come up with proposals and then they see where they can support either financially or, or maybe in uh, terms of uh, technical support. But I, with what we see here and uh, what some of African countries are also looking up to, we do not envisage a situation where the EU comes with uh, funds and they go across the country uh, doing what we are supposed to do. I think uh, we have the private sector who are willing to invest. And all we need to do is to galvanize resources and then see how we can use the private sector and then some boost funds within the EU to see how we can improve uh, uh, the situation at home. I don't know oh. if I got your question. Well, well, thanks, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Onowu. Thank you. Uh, for, for your response, I mean, we couldn't possibly exhaust all the issues arising uh, from that summit. Some of the matters, of course, uh, we will also push to uh, bilateral transactions uh, amongst uh, the various countries. Let's get the closing thoughts of Malan Gabashehu. Malan Gabashehu, in addition to the issues that have been highlighted, uh, are there any hidden takeaways you would want to expose to our viewers? Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, Nigeria is the not the policeman of Africa, but uh, I think if anybody says that, they are not entirely wrong. Because, uh, and uh, is the president uh, is telling the world that uh, you know these uh, things about unconstitutional changes in government, and and in his uh, address, of course, he was talking about a two-way situation, because yes, uh, the military is blameworthy for disrupting democratic processes, but he also put his colleagues on the spot for unconstitutionally changing you know, the primary law of their own countries for Tinoa elongation. And again, we have had these incidents in West Africa. A number of countries, some have survived it at this, up to this point. For others, it's primarily, look at the Guinea Conakry. The crisis really began with that telling elongation. So I think for the first time, uh, the president had this chance to address this, issues, take it to the world stage, and warn that African leaders must not do change just to the constitutions to elongate a tenure and they must also cater to the welfare and well-being of the people so that there will be less and less grounds for discontent. All right, uh, gentlemen, it, it, it's here that uh, we really have to uh, conclude uh, this edition of Good Morning Nigeria. And at this point, I'd like to, uh, first of all, uh, appreciate Dr. Osage Haniri, the Honorable Minister of Health, uh, for sharing his thoughts this morning with us on the program. Uh, thank you, sir, for coming. Thank you, my pleasure. Um, Malam Garbashehu, Senior Special Assistant to the President on Media and uh, Publicity. We also thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, ambassador Ubina Onu, Nigerian Ambassador to Belgium, Luxembourg, and the EU. We also like to appreciate you this morning for uh, sharing your thoughts with us on the AU EU Summit, the sixth edition. All right, and before we leave you, let's get some foreign tidbits.
Mali's parliament voted on Monday a plan allowing the transition